So um, thanks for the invitation. Um, number two meetup. This is very cool. I've, I've done plenty of meetups in Portland. And uh, being a Vancouver native-ish, been here for this area for the last 10 years um, and living up Ridgefield now, it's really nice not to have to go across that stupid bridge. So um, thanks for uh, creating a meetup here. Um, uh, so as I said, I work uh, for Microsoft. I've been with them for about two and a half years. Um, and by the way, they are pretty awesome. They are definitely always hiring, not always quite remote, which I was able to swing, um, but it, it has been a pretty amazing company. If you ever get a chance to interview with them, um, they were doing some awesome stuff. And I'm gonna give you um, some kind of insights into that, um, not necessarily Microsoft specifically, but I, well, I can talk more about that for sure as well. But what I'm gonna talk about specifically tonight is about design systems. Um, design systems um, are in a way kind of nascent in, in that the term at least has really come into its own within the last three or four years. Um, when I wrote uh, the book that kind of spawned this talk as well um, on O'Reilly, um, actually, we was just going to call it front-end architecture. That's what I kind of considered it. Like, we always had back-end architects, but we never had front-end architects. And that's kind of what I always felt was missing, was like uh, some developers that actually cared about the front-end and, and how the front-end was put together. And um, as I was writing the book, the, the um, O'Reilly came back and were like, you know, front-end architecture doesn't quite like hit on all cylinders for everybody out there. How about we throw design systems in there? And I'm like, maybe? <laughs> and at that point, like, Design systems were still kind of like a term people threw around occasionally. Um, and then over the last two or three years since it's been out, it's like obviously design systems are, are really where we've landed with um, how we build front ends, how we distribute front ends, how we really scale up the UI architecture of the, the sites that we built. So I might still consider myself a front end architect. So that sounds like a fun term. Uh, but really what I do is I build design systems. I help facilitate building design systems. That's the work I do at, at, uh, at Microsoft. I'm working with um, uh, a framework called Fabric, which is a React framework, um, completely open source. You can go and steal all of our code and use it tonight if you want to. Um, you can go contribute to it. We take contributions from all over the world, from contributors inside and outside of Microsoft. So um, that's what I get to do, and it's really exciting to do it. Um, What's really fun about this talk is I gave this talk um, uh, over th three years ago. Um, yeah, I think it's about three years ago when I started this talk. Um, and this talk is actually, I gave this talk at my entrance interview to Microsoft because um, I really felt it kind of um, showed what I knowed about this topic, which is what they were trying to hire me for. And um, it's been great because I, I keep, I feel like I keep coming back to it and the talk is still super relevant. Nothing has really changed about it. I've, I've tweaked a couple things here and there, but it's, it's, it's still the same thing. Design systems are what they are, um, and we, we keep um, trying to build better ones. So without further ado, way too much ado, um, we'll get into it. So this talk is called Roadrunner Rules, or more what you call guidelines of a design system. Hopefully you know that one, that's all of it. All right. So what I'm going to dive into is a little um, side um, side tour detour um, in talking about my kids because they're cute. I like talking about them. And this also tells you something because this is my daughter. Um, at this point, she was four years old. She's now seven. Thought about updating the talk, but it just doesn't make sense. So this is my four-year-old daughter because um, when she wants flowers, because um, she loves flowers, um, she asks, Daddy, can I have a flower? Uh, if you don't give her a flower quick enough, like within a second, she says, I want a flower now, and throws a tantrum. Um, and then when you give her a flower, she says, oh, this flower looks beautiful. Kind of melts your heart, and you repeat the process over and over again. All right, um, this is my son. Um, at the point of, shoot, of doing this, he was two. He's, he's now uh, uh, four and a half, going to kindergarten next year. Uh, but he had a slightly different vocabulary when he was this age. When he wanted a flower, he could usually say flower. Uh, but if you didn't give him one in like half a second, because that was his attention span, flower was about, you know, how he changed it up from, you know, asking to telling. And then at the end, flower, nice and calm. And he's happy now because he has a flower in his hand. So, um, so what's the difference between these two kids besides, you know, different age and whatnot? What's the difference between their command over this language? Um, and really what it comes down to is, is one understands how to, how the language is able to, to piece words together, to piece meaning together, to create more complex structures. Um, and the other one does not have that understanding. Um, and why do I talk to you about this? This has anything to do with design systems. No, it does not whatsoever. Um, it has a whole lot to do with linguistics. 
So the first thing we're going to jump into is linguistics. This was a ton of fun when I did research because I really didn't know a ton about linguistics. And uh, oh, it's a fun topic to dive into. And we're going to do a little diving today. So uh, the first thing I want to talk about is um, a quick um, definition of, I, I need to change this because it's actually not linguistics, it's grammar, I think is this definition, but grammar works too. It's a, it's a, a set of structural rules governing the composition of clauses, phrases, and words in a given natural language. Structure, rules, governing clauses, phrases, words. So we're going to come back to that uh, a couple times as we go through this talk. So what I want to do is I want to take this sentence, this flower looks beautiful, and break it down. Use linguistics to understand um, how this, this, this sentence is put together and the value that we get out of it. So the first thing we're going to look at is syntax. This is part of linguistics, and it's the notion of breaking, uh, breaking down a sentence into its structural pieces. So um, syntax allows us to look at the sentence of this flower looks beautiful and recognize that there is an article and a noun combination and a verb adjective combination of the sentence. And each of those create a noun phrase and a verb phrase. And placed together, they actually create the full sentence. So syntax allows us to, to break this thing down into some smaller pieces, understand how one relates to the other, how looks beautiful, conveys meaning onto flower, and so on and so forth, and, and adds meaning to the sentence. Without this kind of structure, these words would be meaningless. There's no point of communicating them. So we'll talk about the next level down, which is this, uh, something of uh, a type of study called morphology. And that's the structure, the composition of words, of individual words. Uh, because we don't just have like single big monolithic words that are made out of nothing. They're usually made out of smaller pieces. So something like beautiful is actually made up of two different words. One, which is a noun of beauty. The second is an adjective of full. Put together, they actually create a more complex adjective, meaning full of beauty. So we're able to do this over and over and over again with different types of words. And you can think of you know, anti-disestablishmentarianism, like they have a field day with that in morphology, like breaking it down into all its pieces and how, you know, adding different suffixes and, and, and com you know, combinations turn it into a different meaning word. So that's morphology. So lastly is phonology, and, and that's the organization of sounds, hooked on phonics, phenomes, uh, phonology. It's all in the same family there. So going past the meaning of words, let's talk about the communication, how we convey these words to, to other people. Um, so um, with phonology, we, we can take things down even past the syllable, where we're actually looking at the onset and the rhyme of a word. So onset being the b, and the rhyme being the u, and then t and e. So breaking these words down to how we communicate them, how do we actually form these sounds to communicate these to other people so that when they hear the word, they're hearing that onset, they're hearing that rhyme, they're actually able to put the pieces together and understand what you're saying. So that allows us to take this flower looks beautiful, break it down to the smallest little onsets and rhymes, put those pieces together, create more complex words, put them together through syntax to create a sentence that actually conveys some meaning. And my four-year-old at that time got it. My two-year-old still working at it. So it's really, it's amazing these things that we learn how to do this. We learn how to put these pieces together and learn these words, learn how we can actually combine them together into the sentences. So what does this have to do with design systems? Well, absolutely nothing. But what this does have a lot to do with is visual language. So uh, let's talk about visual language real quick. Um, and what I want to ask is, what would happen? I'm thirsty, so I'm drinking beer. Great idea. <coughs> ah, the Northwest. Um, what would happen if we did a scientific study of a visual language? And you're like, Micah? A visual language and a spoken language are two completely different things. Why would you ever study a visual language in the way you try and study a spoken language? So let's dive into it and why you might do that. Um, we'll look at a couple definitions. Um, this one's coming just straight from Wikipedia, visual language. It is a system of communication using visual elements. You change that second part to spoken words, it's the exact same thing. It's a system of communication. One just happens to be visual, one happens to be spoken. So we recognize that they both have this common goal of communication. Uh, they're trying to communicate ideas like trust, value, reliability, authority. They're trying to also, I have another slide about that. Yeah, and also they're trying to communicate intention. So like click here, read this first, this is most important, go, to, go here for help and whatnot. 
when I wrote this talk, you'll see a lot of Red Hat because I was working at Red Hat prior to um, getting a job at Microsoft. So it's obviously where my, a lot of my examples came from. But as you can see with this design, everything about this design leads you to one thing, a big shiny red button they want you to click. The, the, the way that the words are uh, returned, the way that the, the artwork is going from right to left, everything about says that you want to click on that red learn more button. The colors they use, everything about it says you need to click here. That's a conversion that they're trying to make through this, uh, this language that they're using. That's a communication of intent. Another definition of, um, uh, of visual language comes from um, IBM's uh, design system. We've got a beautiful site that dives into lots of great concepts about design systems. And they say that it's a shared vocabulary for design. This design system or this visual language is, is how we communicate this vocabulary that we have for design. And here we see the same thing. We see this, this word vocabulary. It's, like it's, it's the same idea of having a bunch of words to speak with in the same way we have different visual elements to speak with. So yeah, maybe we could break it down using the uh, same, same scientific method. And we see they both share really similar traits as well between a spoken language and a visual language. We have dialects, things like word length, information density, power colors, um, all these things that are different depending on the, um, uh, the part of the world that you're in. And same thing with dialects when you're in the South or when you're in Bronx or in New Jersey or something. We have different ways of speaking things. When you're in different parts of the country, they have different colors, mean different things. Um, all these things are different um, in, in spoken languages, and they're definitely true in visual languages as well. And this is a great example that I found at the time. Um, I should probably check and see if it's, it's still as relevant. But NHK World, it's a, it's a Japanese news website. This is their English edition. And you, if you looked at it, you would just go like, okay, that's a news website. It's like every other news website out there. It's got a big banner image. It's got lots of space. It's got all these call to action, these red buttons to click on, and big titles and everything. Well, here's the exact same website on the exact same day for their Japanese speakers. It's a very different website. Information density, the number of colors, the general layout, like this is the same company building two different visual languages for two different audiences, and they couldn't be any different. So dialects, we definitely have those in common between the two. We even have things like jargon. Um, jargon is... Um, like um, uh, industry-specific uh, words or communication that we use. So, um, you know, if you're a doctor's office, you've got all these things. If you're a web developer, you've got all this jargon that we use. Um, but we also have this inside of um, original languages as well. I, I thought of this one a while ago that like, this is just such a common visual pattern that we use. I mean, everyone that looks at this, you're like, oh, okay. Stuff on the left, that's your cheap stuff where you get small features. Thing on the right, that's the expensive thing where you get a lot of the features. Enterprise on the right, Three on the left, yeah, we know what that is. Like, you've seen that enough that that is the jargon within the visual language that we do. Price quality matrix, yes. We also have things called, like, we still also have slang within both visual and, auto, and, uh, and spoken languages. So, I mean, with, with slang, I won't try and speak much spoken slang, but in visual slang, we have things like carousels. It's, slang is words that take on different meaning or made up words. So, in this case, We've got like these arrows and, and circles. These are the parts of our language that take on different meaning through this visual language. These circles at the bottom, when there's three of them, we know obviously there's three images in this carousel. And if there's arrows on left and right, obviously those move us from image to image. Some of the slang within our visual languages that uh, are, are common through most websites you come across. You also have the infamous hamburger. Everyone has this, no one knows really where it came from, it's the mystery meat of our websites, but darn it, if you got a button up there, it's got three lines in it, you click on it, you know you're gonna get more stuff. This is slang within our industry. So we understand that this set of structural rules governing composition of clauses, phrases, and words in a given natural language. Well, if we chop out visual or uh, natural language and, and swap in visual language, this is kind of what we're talking about. It's the same kind of study works for a visual language that works for a spoken language. So let's dig into that. Let's take this nice little mock-up I've got going on here with our, uh, again, the cute kids from many, many years ago. Um, and let's talk about how we can break this down in that same way we took the sentence of this flower looks beautiful. How can we take this, um, uh, take this visual mock-up and break it down using those same tools? 
So as we talk about syntax, the structure of sentences, we, have a, we understand when looking at this visually how this breaks down, that we've got headers, we've got banners, we've got content, and we can use those, these rules and syntax to understand how these sites get broken down, as well as how we can all, also how we can put them together. Um, and you know, we have our kind of standards for how we do it in, in, in our visual languages. In other countries, you might see slightly different patterns and whatnot, but we all have our syntax about how those are expected to be put together. Uh, and we, yeah, I think that was the point. And we understand that, um, that there's a header at the top of the page, and that header is probably going to continue to be the same over and over again. And we understand there's a form field up at the top of the header. That's probably something for us to log in with. There's some of these things in the syntax of the visual language just help us to understand when we see something, we get meaning from it very quickly. So, next thing we'll talk about is morphology. This notion of structure and composition of words. So, in here we've got two different words. We've got an input, we've got a submit button. You can consider those words, very complex words. Um, and through morphology, we can understand these words can be broken down into smaller pieces. So, we can understand that uh, the words can be broken down um, from the natural state, we can take out some of those anime. Oh, I swear I had one more slide in there. I went too fast. Um, take out the animations, take out the color, take out the iconography, just continue to remove all of these pieces, actually build these words up, and we're left with the most simple input and button. So breaking these things down, we're able to get to those smallest pieces. Like, what are those core elements we actually use to build up these much more complex um, complex words. So lastly, let's talk about phonology. So this idea of sound. Obviously we, sure, our computers have some sounds coming out of them, but we're talking about a visual language, we're really talking about the, the pixels on the page and, and how they look and how we interact with them. So when talking about phonology, we can talk about things like layout. We can talk about like the balance and proportion and white space and, and the room that's given to the various elements on the page. We can talk about typography, the weights and scales, and what's the largest, what stands out the most, um, you know, how we're using various different font faces and those types of things to uh, convey meaning. Iconography, whether it's interface, ornamental, we use these icons to typically apply additional visual meaning to the, um, the content we already have. They usually, they usually don't get picked up by screen readers, they're really just visual elements that give you visual cues as to what something does. These are all these sounds. So just like we had onset and rhyme here and for visual, we've got lots of other smaller pieces. Color is another one of those. So the various palettes and shades, the contrast ratios that we use. Using color uh, allows us to differentiate various pieces on, on the page and give different meaning to them. So color makes a large part of that phonology. And lastly, um, our websites aren't static. They're not posters. They're not just something to read on the side of a wall. They're, they're interactive. So the way that when we interact with them, we want some kind of feedback. And animation has a large part of that. Like what type of animation, what kind of feedback and response do we get when we click on something? You know, how does that, that visual spin, how does that thing move? How does the progress indicator move across the page? So these are all the pieces that we have as we break it down to the, the smallest onsets, the rhymes, just the, the sounds we make with our mouth. The same way we have all these, these small visual elements of color and typography and iconography and animation, putting those back together, we're able to actually start constructing our site. So we have tools to create complex words. We're able to walk through those and, and add all those various pieces until we get that finished product, putting those complex things together to create those more complex words. And then we have one more. Then we have rules to create these more complex stories where we move past just words. How are we going to communicate much larger ideas? How do we take the submit, um, uh, the, the, like the login section, and put it in context of your entire application. Like what are you logging into? Are you logging into an admin section? Is this your page? Is this your shopping cart? All of these, um, uh, all of the syntax we have will help people understand what are we doing? What's happening? What's the rest of the story? You know, it, what does the, what does the, the, uh, the login in the upper right pertain to? Um, pertains to this website and what you're logging into. Is a shopping cart what you're logging into? So all these rules allow us to break things down to the smallest pieces. Once we have all those pieces, we can then put them back together. And last thing I was gonna say, I guess I didn't write it down, um, is what's great about this is, um, one more, get to it, is that this is one story we've placed together. Taking all of these small pieces, creating words out of them, creating stories out of them, 
But this is just one of many. And I swear there's one more line in there. Maybe they didn't get saved or something like that. Um, and what's great about it is once you have all these small pieces, this is one thing you build. But as you build more and more and more different experiences, you're able to leverage all those pieces over and over again. So this is the power of design systems, is, is taking that scientific approach to your visual language, breaking it down to the smallest pieces possible so that when you're ready, you can build up new words, build up new sentences, new experiences for your end users. All right, now this whole putting things back together and making more complex structures out of it, this is definitely not new. Uh, if you've seen this before, this has been around for a number of years, 2015 to be specific. And this is the notion of atomic design. Brad Frost was, probably, was one of the first ones to really popularize this um, and really kind of make a name for himself uh, building and teaching uh, about, um, about design systems and this notion of atomic design. Taking atoms, combining them together to make molecules, molecules together to make organisms, um, using page templates to put content in and, and actually getting content, and page content at the end. But this wasn't the first time that atomic design and this composition structure and visual language, um, it wasn't the first design system to say the least. Uh, back in 1999, um, there was work done from Frog Design um, in Germany, uh, working with the Dell website. Um, they were launching a, a brand new um, e-commerce site huge effort, huge site, and they took the exact same approach of breaking things down into small pieces so you could build them back up, compose them up, and build larger experiences. Every page wasn't something brand new. It was all based on a shared set of controls. So it's been around a long time. It's just kind of taken a while for us all to really catch on to it. It's taken a while for all the tools to really catch up to the point where it was easier, easy to do this at a smaller scale. So, Set of structural rules governing the composition clauses, phrases, and words in any given visual language. We're not talking linguistics anymore. We're definitely talking design systems. So design systems, looking at the structure, the rules, governing clauses, phrases, words, in this visual language. This design system gives us all the structure and the rules we need to be able to take our visual language and actually piece that together. Because a visual language is great by itself. Designers spend a lot of time figuring out what that is, but without an actual system, without a system to, to recognize what all those various pieces are. Um, the design language is that study. That design language is breaking that visual language down into the small pieces. It is the linguistics. So let's talk about design systems. Finally get to the meat and the topic. Uh, as I was getting ready for this talk, I was like, hey, why do people want to know about design systems? And smart ass Josh Riggs, who is down in Portland, he's awesome, um, asked, well, what is a design system? And I was like, oh, I guess that's a, probably a good, good place to start when someone asks you, uh, what, what you want to know about something. Um, and what I love about this tweet is, um, except for the fact that it's, <laughs> I've talked about so much and linked to it so much, it still has like four likes, it's really kind of sad. But um, I love it because the, it's a definition I wrote back in the days of 140 characters um, that I think still holds up till today. Because um, I, you know, I had a lot of choices here. I could write some lofty medium post, I could go into a multi-thread kind of thing or I could just be sadistic and try and fit everything in 140 characters minus his name. So this is what I came up with um, after a lot of wordsmithing, that a design system is a set of rules and assets that define how to express everything a visual language needs to say. So again, we're talking about rules, we're talking about assets, those things that are created. We're talking about expressing things that a language needs to say, like how do we speak something? If I, if I don't have the words to express something to you verbally, I'm stumped, I can't like, I'll mime it or something like that. If I can't actually figure out the word is, if you, if you aren't native to language, you might forget what the word is and you can't express that simple thing if you just had that word. And that's the same notion of a design system is we need to be able to express everything that visual language needs to say. Because again, it's not just a poster on the wall. We need to actually be able to build this in a website. So let's dive into this more. Um, I talked about rules, I talked about assets and let's jump into what I mean by that. So rules are things like methodologies. So whether you're using like OOCSS to break up your, um, the, separate the skin and structure from the containers and the content. Whether you're using SMACs to um, create a folder structure to lay out all of your different styles um, and in the way that you build your classes. Whether you're using BIM in a way to create really flat CSS selectors that have uh, a lot of detail, a lot of meaning directly in the CSS selector. Or if you just make something of your own. These are methodologies that you use within your framework to describe 
this is how we are doing this. This is how we've agreed to do it. This is the structure of it. Here's the rules of it. This is what you can do and can't do. So that if someone writes some really nasty, horrible selector, you're like, stop. That is horrible. We've written in the guidelines about this is how you should write selectors. Please go do that. These are the methodologies that help us define how our design systems are built. Because in the end, they are code. And we need to figure out how do we express styles? How do we attach styles to a DOM element? Is it through some CSS and JS library? Is it through some BEM syntax or something that you've made up of your own? Make sure that is actually written down in part of your system. There's also a number of rules of thumb um, that can be really important. Um, for me, single source of truth is really important. So that if you, have a, um, uh, if you have a header up top in blog and you have another header one down for your blog title, those are two separate blog titles and I think I'm jumping to a different one. Um, yes, the, so that, that blog title right there in this CSS example is getting styles from both the blog feed H1 as well as the article title. In this case, it does not have two sources of truth. It, or one single source, it has two sources of truth. There's two places it's getting styles. And you can see because of that, the font size is actually being declared in multiple places, which means you now have an issue of like, well, which one loads first? It's gonna depend on, that's gonna determine which one actually gets the style. On top of that, if I'm gonna add a stuff, I need to add color to this. Where does that go? Does that go in the blog feed H1 or the article title? Like having to ask those questions is, is difficult because you usually you'll get it wrong most of the time. Second one, single responsibility principle. Is the idea that everything you write has a single responsibility, has one job to do and to do well. And so we have a similar setup where we've got a blog feed with an, uh, the headline inside of it, and then we have a headline class down in the footer. For one, using two class names like that's probably no-no. But <laughs> in this example, if we have a headline class, this headline is now being used in both places, up, up in the blog feed as well in the footer. So it's not, it doesn't have a single responsibility. It's now styling headlines in multiple places. If those aren't actually the exact same headline, you're gonna be in trouble because when this comes around, you're like, well, I need to change the one in the blog feed to be uppercase, but I don't want the footer one to change. Well, you've just broken your first rule of single source of truth. Problem. These are the kind of rules you get in place in your design system to help drive how you create styles for all your various controls. And they're very important to have. Flat CSS selectors, I talked about this with BEM. It's very important if you've dealt with CSS much, specificity is great when you use it well, but it's a double-edged sword when you use it poorly, it wreaks havoc on your life. Don't do this. This is aboutcontact.hero.container with a direct child of section.featurequarter, direct child section.fcontact h3, we'll, we'll apply color to it, which is great because when that, when that h3 gets a hover effect, well, or an active effect, easy. We'll just add a dot active onto this large monster string. Don't be there, don't be this person. Um, it's not a good thing to do. Um, instead, build specific, long, descriptive selectors that have a single responsibility or applied to a single space about contact title, and then you can have an active version of it as well, which changes the color to white. A few other ways to do this as well, but have rules about this to explain how do you build these controls? How do you build them in a way that scales? So we talked about lots of code, but there's also talking about assets, um, the various guidelines you use about like, how do you create your, your, your icons? Like what is the, the general um, uh, design guideline for, for how you're building those? And how are those icons used? In the same way, photography, like what style of photography are you using? Like are you using, you know, not like super chipper, like super hyper smiley faces, or you try and keep it more natural? Uh, the various color tones that you use, you want to keep consistent across the site. So having these things actually documented is an important thing to do uh, when you're dealing with lots of images. But then you get into cases where you've got custom rules. Right? In, in our case at Red Hat, we were building this thing for several months, and we kept coming back to these rules over and over again that, that really didn't land in any of these methodologies or rules of thumb. It was just, this is the way that we built things. When we're dealing with um, content components, they never had padding, they never had margins, they never had uh, heights or widths or anything. And then when we were dealing with container components, they were always just containers. Widths, margins, padding, all of that, never color, never font sizes, never anything else. So we had this separation. It was kind of some of our custom rules and we recognized that we really never had a chance to get them down on paper. And realizing that, we, we figured out that these rules really need to be visible. They, they, 
once they're visible, we can also make sure we agree on them because we've written them down, we've described them, and then we can make sure they're also actionable. Make sure that if there is a, a rule that is not being followed, that there is like guidance about how can I follow that then? What is the alternative to this really ridiculously long selector besides stop? Like there needs to be a way for us to be able to do that. Right? And these custom rules were really important for, uh, for us. And um, I started writing them down. Um, and, and ironically, I started writing them down and I was getting up to like 20 or like 25 rules. I'm like, okay, this is getting ridiculous. I'm, I'm literally just like writing my, I don't know, linter or something like that. And I decided I really need to break these rules down into rules that are actionable. Because <laughs> not all of them are actionable. So anyway, long story, I had rules about my rules and I, I'm a dork like that. But what we ended up with was a set of rules. And um, around the same time on Twitter, if you're... Um, on Twitter back in these days, um, this thing popped up on, on Twitter. And everyone is sharing around, everyone's talking about it. Um, there's still a question as to if it's really valid or not, but man, it made a really good point. Um, these are the Roadrunner rules. These are the rules that Chuck Jones supposedly gave to his writers, gave to his animators, gave to all of his staff about what the uh, Coyote and the Roadrunner can and cannot do in the universe of the Roadrunner. So, Roadrunner cannot harm the Coyote except by going beep beep. And obviously there's no dialogue ever, well, except for beep beep. So all of these rules help all of their designers, help all the writers, help all of the pencil shaders, whatever people were working on this uh, project to make sure that they had a consistent worldview of you know, what this universe is supposed to look like, how these things are supposed to interact. So as you went from one episode to the next episode to the next episode, there's continuity, there's consistency. And it was these types of rules that we wanted to model. And it's why we called our rules the Roadrunner rules and was the obvious impetus for the name of this talk. So getting these, these rules written down, getting them agreed upon, making sure that they're actionable is extremely important. So um, those, were, um, uh, those are the rules. Um, so let's talk about assets. That's the other half. Rules by themselves don't give you any tools to work with. It's a set of rules. Um, assets are what you actually are going to build your site out of. So obviously we're building websites in this case, so we need HTML. There's a bunch of different ways that we can create and provide HTML throughout a, uh, through a design system. For instance, we can literally just give you the markup. This is Bootstrap. This is like, copy this, drop it in there, give a CSS file at the top of the page, and you'll have a UI. Enjoy, go forth and prosper building identical sites all over the internet. Um, but it worked because the barrier of entry was so ridiculously low. You, you put a link tag at the top of the page, you copy and paste code in, and it works. You combine stuff together and it works. It's pretty amazing at simplicity. But once somebody copies and pastes that into the site, there's no going back. You can't go back and tell them, oh, you need to change that class name or change that p tag to a div or whatever the case is. There's really no going back besides maybe updates the CSS. So, this is dangerous, and this is why they don't rev on it super often. And when the new version comes out, it's not compatible with the old one. So another way to approach this is through templates. It's the idea of here's a package of templates that you can use to render inside of your application. So in this case, this was um, some Twig files we wrote. We were doing Drupal back in the day, um, and um, we were actually were. Has anyone used Drupal? Okay. Oh wow, way too many hands. I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, this was back in the Drupal 7 days where it was all PHP templates and just concatenating strings till they blew in the face. Um, we ended up just hacking the entire Drupal 7 instance and shoving Twig into it so that we could write nice templates like this in Twig. Because um, the thing with templates, it's great. It's like you render a template, you pass data into it, and it renders markup on the other side. So we could distribute these templates out to our applications. They could easily render this, and if we need to update it, we can give them a new template. Given, you know, given the same props in, it'll return some new markup or class name or whatever the case is. So that's great. But there's one more step we can go with this is more of a black box, black, black box type of approach of creating a component. Um, and I wrote this way before I'd ever, ever even heard of React, which is great and why this, this talk is, still has legs. And this is definitely the model that everyone is moving towards of this idea of I've got a component, something I can install with, via in this case, from um, this is from a Lonely Planet, uh, the style guide that they wrote. Um, the, theirs is all it's, it's all Ruby based, so same thing. Like install a Ruby gem, install an npm package. You do install something and you call a function, and after that function's done, it's going to return you some markup. 
What happens during that time? We don't know. It could call one template. It could call one template. It calls five templates. It could call some service and return you something. Like, you don't know. And, it doesn't, and you shouldn't know and shouldn't care because it could change from one day to the next. And that's the power of this is you have a contract of URL, title, description, image URL. Given that passed into the function, we will return to you markup proper. In the case of React, styles as well, and functionality as well, and everything you need to render this onto the page. So this component design system, component based system is inc incredibly powerful because of that, that black box, that just being able to provide an interface, people can call the function and get back the markup that you want them to have. Where one day it's one template and another day it's a dozen templates. So on top of that, on top of those templates that we are providing through um, some or providing HTML through some type of source, um, there's a bunch of other assets as well we need to provide, whether that's CSS, JavaScript, various fonts and images. We could just have people like install these and bake them into their Git repo. We could distribute them through NPM or any other package service. Um, we also have a lot of assets within our design systems, all these built assets, things that start as one thing and actually convert it into another. So we have SAS that turns into our CSS. We have TypeScript that transpiles down to JavaScript and ES6 down to ES5 and so forth. Oh, that's my next one. JavaScript down to ES5 modules. Uh, all the task renders that help us do this. So there's a bunch of tools that are involved in that as well. So as you're building a design system, this is part of it. And this whole notion of design system ops, I, I love as, as things grow, you start getting more of these um, uh, specialities of like, literally, I am a design system ops engineer. What I do is I build systems to help people build design systems. That's people's jobs. There's like job descriptions out there. That that's what you do. Like how can I build an editor so I can drag and drop components onto a page and it spit out a JSON file I can drop in my application and boom, have a UI. That's the kind of stuff that we're starting to build now with uh, uh, in, inside of design systems as we kind of start to scale them up and, and get these specialities. All right, so um, uh, let's see, moving from the um, kind of like the, the shipped assets, I'll also talk about documentation. So documented design system. Uh, there's a few different ways you can go about this. Um, one is a general style guide, and that's really documenting the rules. Um, again, I wrote this a number of years ago. I should probably update some of these examples as some of these projects are probably less than, um, uh, less than fresh. Uh, some of the older ones, KSS, Hologram, SAS doc, uh, so really great tools to be able to base, to, to document how to build things. Um, the various colors you use, the font sizes you use, um, all of the kind of the do's and don'ts of all your various controls can be considered a style guide, a human interface guide, whatever, uh, whatever you want to call it. Oftentimes these style guides are the things that are built by design and passed off to development to actually implement. So you might have a style guide that describes what a button looks like, how a button is supposed to padding and the fonts and the various states and those types of things that's passed off to like a React team and an Angular team and a knockout, bless their souls, team um, to actually go and implement. So there, there's definitely some, a lot of cases where style guides are really important and, and actually to a point we, if we put like human interface guides, we actually do these at Microsoft as well. We still have, uh, we still have more of the, the pattern library, which we'll talk about next. But then we have some like human interface guides as well. Um, oh, get, get through all these. Anybody ever use SAS doc? It's kind of a, a cool way to, um, uh, if you ever use um, JS doc, similar thing. It's like there's a little um, comment block at the top of every function that gets pulled in and documentation gets written. Same thing with SAS doc. It's, it's kind of cool. Uh, not super supported as people aren't doing as much with SAS, but it was a cool project. Um, pattern libraries, on the other hand, instead of, um, uh, instead of documenting all the rules, um, they're documenting, more focused on documenting the actual assets. Oftentimes the you know, pattern library combines the rules as well, but really they're focused on show me the control rendered on the page and how I can use it as well. Show me the various modes for it, show me how I can interact with it and the props I can pass into it. Um, so a couple of tools um, that have been around recently, like Fractal, kind of the granddaddy of them all, Pattern Lab, that's what Brad Frost um, uh, had, had, had put together and kind of pioneered. Um, another really um, a recent entrance to this that's still really popular right now is Storybook. Um, Storybook is JavaScript based. Um, it used to be purely React, but now they do React, they do Vue, I think they have Angular, um, pretty much anything JavaScript you can render onto the page and put your controls onto the page. And this is incredibly important. Um, I had a, a very angry tweet a number of, number of months ago that um, I, was trying to, I was trying to document someone's quote unquote design system. But unfortunately, the design, the components 
literally could not be run outside of the runtime. Like they had this big app. And the only way you could actually render the component was in their application, spun up in their servers and you know, with their all the bootstrapping they had to, to do it. And I'm like, that's not a component. Like if I can't take it and render it in, in my documentation, it's not a component. That's that's just code abstraction. And in that case, really poor code abstraction. So having a place, a pattern library to actually pull these patterns out, to extract them from the application, have them in a place where you can document them, see them, peruse them. It's like a library. Like let me look at all the books in there. I don't want to have to like go to the manufacturer to read them. Uh, is a very important thing to do. So as you're building a design system, having documentation is one of the key pillars of doing so. So as I said, design systems are a set of rules and assets. We've covered those two things. But the second half of this definition is that they are, they're, made, they're made to define how we express everything a visual language needs to say. Um, and the way I'll talk about that is, is through this bit of work that we had to do at Red Hat. Um, this was a page I just split up into two because it was literally too large to fit onto this. You can go there now, it's their country pages. Um, they have like one for each country, just kind of like a, like a profile of, of the stuff they do in that country. And um, it's big. And they had a lot of stuff they wanted to do. This is what the, pay, what the actual mock-up looked like when it was all done. Um, and they wanted to communicate a lot of things. They wanted to communicate local contacts and popular links and featured resources and news and events and calendars. They wanted to communicate lots of things. And I keep saying this word because it's important. They needed a language to communicate all these things in. And typically with these kind of designs, we would just kind of start from the top and go to the bottom, make the whole thing up. Basically build a new language to make this one page. But with a design system, we didn't have to do that. We already had words created. We already had rules about how words could be combined together. So um, let's just take a look at, at two of these bands, we call them, just these chunks of content, um, and see how we can break these down uh, into those smaller pieces. So we already had layouts. We created these layouts that are reuse reusable layouts with either like five up or three up or seven up, wh whatever we needed to, to do in a band. We had the band construct already, layouts we can put content inside of. And a majority of the things we did fit into this, like a you know, two up layout or maybe like a, a two and a third or something like that. We had all the layouts already figured out. So any band that we created, just reuse those layouts. We had image components. We had an image component that literally we could use for anything. We could use it for a thumbnail, we could use it for a full page banner, we could have a dozen of them inside of a carousel. Anything we needed an image for it was the same component. There's no image tags used in the application. You call this image component. And this gives us a lot of flexibility because we can, we can do some fun stuff behind the scenes. We can do some special CSS. We can have special props that are passed in to, to do some logic and make some smart decisions. Without that, everyone's just throwing random image tags on the page. We have um, the, these headers up top. Um, in the past, different headers would have um, come from different files with different CSS styles. Um, if you needed a, a different variation of the header, you just kind of hack on it and do something of your own and just try and match the CSS styles. But in this case, we had one component that could do um, uh, either a, like a um, dark mode or a light mode, different uh, header with different types of content in the header, and we could reuse those over and over again. Anywhere you saw a band with a header, it was the exact same component for that header. Of course, we have the infamous call to action buttons. These are our million dollar buttons we spend way too much time um, uh, focusing on. It's true, buttons are crazy. Um, and then with image embeds, the same thing. We have a single image embed. This is how we embed videos onto our page. This is how the content is placed and the links are placed. We have thumbnails, they can automatically be imposed on top of it. All that functionality gets done once and used within the rest of the system. So great, so we have these small number of components I've showed. We had a lot more, but just with those couple, now we can look at this page and go, you know what? Yeah, this whole page, yeah, we've got like, oh, like 80, 90% of this page done. Like give us like two days, we'll get the rest of it done. We literally laughed at this because they thought it was gonna be so much work to do this big, huge page. But because we already had all these components already built, because the design system was reusing, as the visual language was reusing these components, we could, we could um, compose a page like this in a very small amount of time. Our workload was cut dramatically. Now at this point you're like, whoa, slow down, hold on. I've seen this episode before, I know what happens at the end, and the coyote always gets it. You see, we build this robot, we think it's gonna help us out and automate all the things. It's like, yay, it helps us catch the roadrunner, and in the end, the robot ends up eating us, and it takes our jobs, and we can't even work at McDonald's. Um, you might think you're working yourself out of a job, by like, well, if I, if I don't 
create like pages upon pages upon pages of, of markup in CSS, well, what am I going to do? I don't have a job left. Well, fortunately, as it turns out, you keep your job because they realize that's a ton of value and it saved us a bunch of effort. We can ship faster. Now, how can we do it better? How can we build some of those tools so our designers can work with your system? How can we get accessibility improved? How can we uh, get our performance faster? How can we get testing and visual testing? How can we go to those next steps where we're not just monkeys having to build out components after components? How can we actually take this to the next level? And that's what we've been doing at Microsoft for the last two and a half years. What is that next level? How can we automate that? What's the next level? How can we automate that and move on? So design systems are the future of the web. I said this three years ago. It's even more true today. Um, and they are not, uh, they're the future of the web, and I will not fight the future. And thank you very much. <laughs> 755, nailed it. Yeah, what's that? Oh, yeah, if you have any questions whatsoever, feel free. Anything about work at Microsoft, working in React? Who uses React? Is it still in Fabric at all? Sure. Fabric um, so Fabric, <coughs> Office UI Fabric um, is, let's see which one I go to. I'll just go to GitHub. So um, Fabric is a, um, it's a React UI framework um, built completely open source. Um, it's a set of React controls. So when I say React controls, I mean little pieces of functionality. Just like we broke things down to, um, uh, broke things down with, um, um, you know, with syntax and morphology and whatnot, these small pieces. The same thing, when you look at a big application, it's really built out of a lot of these primitives. So whether it's a bunch of buttons, or checkboxes, or choice groups, combo boxes, drop downs, labels, links, ratings, sliders, these are all the building blocks we use to build all of our applications. There's no reason that when someone's building a new app at Microsoft, that they should have to go and build a new spin button. Like, let's build this once. Let's build this together as a team, so that when we need one of these buttons that, oh yeah, you can, you can do that, and you can do up and down arrow on the keyboard, and like there's all this accessibility built into it and screen reader support and performance and so on and so forth. Let's do that once so that everyone that now wants to use one of these types of controls can just install this package, take a dependency off it and say, spin button please. Oh, hey, look at this. In the same way, I can create a code pen. I can pull in our library here and I can put a spin button on the page and now I'm using a spin button inside of this code pen. So, just the simplicity of creating these controls that since it's React, they, they can contain state, you can pass props into them, you can style them, they can be theme aware, so on and so forth, that we can create these components that can be reused and as we build our applications, um, I don't, I'm not logged in anything at all, but if you, like if you use Outlook for the web, look at the command bar up top, there's this big command bar up there, it's the exact same code that's being used in all the command bars across all the various applications and past that, the command bar is actually built out of a bunch of smaller pieces. There's a few things that help with our like resizing and there's buttons and so forth in there that if you use Word and Excel and PowerPoint in the web, it's the exact same controls up in the ribbon. So we're able to share so much of this code and when someone from say Word Excel comes and like writes a, um, a performance improvement for some of that code, everyone benefits from that performance improvement. So you gain just the knowledge of this huge company all contributing to the same effort to make it more accessible, to make it more performant, to make the bundle size smaller, to give it more features, and so on and so forth. So yeah, all these components are um, self-contained. Um, they can all be used. The nice thing with the React, it's like it's so unopinionated. You could have a huge application built in whatever you want. If you want one React component dropped in, you can just plug it right in there. Use our control anywhere you want to. Um, they all maintain their own state. You can have multiple instances of it with different prompts passed in and so forth. And, you can literally create a full application out of pretty much 95% what comes from this UI. And the great thing for Microsoft is it means that the UIs you built look like our UIs. They look like our applications. If you're building like an add-on that's gonna go in the side panel of, of Excel, you can use Fabric and build your add-on and drop it in. It's gonna look identical to the rest of the UI. If you're trying to build something for SharePoint, SharePoint's one of the biggest users of Fabric. So your stuff is going to look identical. It's going to work identically. The, the accessibility, like the um, contextual menu, when you click on a contextual menu, 
you get a drop down, you've got arrow keys that work way up and down, escape button escapes out, tabbing is able to go through, enter, like all of this is gonna be identical for every application that uses this control. And whether it's visual or whether it's the way that it works through keyboard or screen reader support, uh, we get that kind of consistency and coherence across all our applications. Does that give you a good rundown? Cool. Yeah, and React makes that possible. It's an incredible framework to do it in. Um, if anyone's looking to get better JavaScript, learn React is what I love about it the most. Like, I, there, actually, a fun story was I was reading, there's, um, there's, this, there's this problem with React. In, if you have, um, you can do React as a class. It's like a JavaScript class. Like, my class, you know, extends a React component. Um, we have to do a bunch of extra boilerplate to get functions to attach properly because of JavaScript scope is horrible. Um, and I read a blog article that had nothing to do with React whatsoever, but it explained that phenomena perfectly and helping you understand it. Because at the end of the day, React is literally JavaScript functions that just happen to render markup. And that's what's amazing. When you want to loop through like a bunch of components, you write a for loop. You, you take an array and you, and you throw each on it or something like that. You literally are writing JavaScript to create your UI. And that's what I love about React is you don't have to learn some random syntax that you decorate your, your markup with or something like that. You literally have to know JavaScript better. Cool. Any other questions? Any of those topics? Yes. For like a, for a design system, you mean? Yeah. yeah. Um, there's certainly, a, there's a lot of projects that are really free form where it's more art than it is a consistent UI. Um, I mean, for instance, even at Red Hat, there's a lot of cases where, um, um, where they, you know, just they wouldn't use what we have because they're changing things so constantly. So like the, the home page is one of those examples where they really never used our stuff because they were constantly changing, constantly modifying, trying new things, A-B testing over and over again. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's a lot of instances where um, uh, there's some apps from the Microsoft, they're just trying to, to move and innovate so fast that they want to be able to break things and throw things away and try new things and, and not, not worry about the speed at which the rest of the framework works. Um, so, you know, it's a double-edged sword. I mean, there's, you also lose out of the, you have to build everything yourself and you don't get a lot of the built-in value that comes from the design system. Um, and so we're trying to balance that of like, we want to move fast enough that you can take a dependency off it and not feel held back. Um, but then we also want to have so much value in there that it'd be stupid not to use it. Um, so for instance, with Fabric, we, um, we literally release a new version of Fabric every day. So all the code that gets pulled in from whatever pull request today at 5 a.m. or 5 p.m. or whenever the, the cron job runs, it will take all that code, create a new release, and spit out the new release. So that's one of the things that we do to kind of reduce that friction, where if there's a bug, you don't have to wait like three months for a new release of the product or something like that. You literally, I mean, if you need it today, we can click a button and get you a release in an hour kind of thing. So it's that kind of stuff. We, we, we look for those things and we try to figure out like how can we serve those people better? And sometimes it's like, ah, they just want to do what they want to do and that's fine and we accept it. Cool, any other questions? Or are we like, are you good? Okay. <laughs> Okay. Okay, thank you. No problem, thank you. Thank you.